Tonight, uh, I'd like to start off by asking a question. What is the most important thing to you right now? What is the most important thing? I know there's a lot going on in our lives. There's a lot going on in our country and in our world. Things have been turned upside down. So when you think about that question, your mind immediately probably goes to something that's directly in front of you right now, something that you're facing. But I want to submit to you tonight that really the most important thing in your life is always the most important thing in your life. And I'm speaking to Christians, to believers in Jesus Christ. The most important thing in any Christian's life should be and is our relationship with Jesus Christ, our fellowship with Jesus Christ. We try to put a lot of emphasis on our fellowship as believers, not just with one another, but first and foremost with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. <clears throat> you can have the Bible right, or I could say this, you can have the right Bible and have the wrong fellowship. You can have the King James Bible, but not be in fellowship with the Lord. You can have your doctrine right, but have the wrong fellowship. You can have your church attendance right, but the wrong fellowship. You can come to Sunday school, but not have fellowship with Jesus Christ. The most important thing for you as a child of God is your personal fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you can have somebody sitting in church and maybe they have their doctrine right. They know how to rightly divide the word of truth. They don't take Old Testament passages and try to force them into the church age. Or they don't take tribulation passages aimed at a Jew surviving in the great tribulation and try to force them back into the church age in which we live. They've got the Bible right as far as dispensations, as far as rightly dividing it. They might even have some convictions right. They might think and say and profess that certain things are wrong to do. They might have some convictions, and may I go a little further and say, they might have some opinions right. Boy, can't we be highly opinionated. I guarantee you, you have your own opinion about this whole virus thing, where it started, how it started, who started it, what the media is doing good, what the media is doing bad, what the president and the civic leaders are doing good, what they're doing bad. I'm sure you're full of opinions. You can have right opinions, but your fellowship with Jesus Christ can still be wrong. You can have somebody in church and they can say amen when you preach against the false religions, when you preach against the false Bibles, when you preach against some sin they're not committing, and they can be out of fellowship with Jesus Christ concerning their own personal walk with God. Doctrine is foundation. Don't misunderstand me. I know 1 Timothy 3, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The first thing it says is doctrine. Doctrine is the foundation. If you do not have your doctrine right, you will not be able to properly build upon the things that you know so then you can experience the right relationship with God based on the things you know. I understand that. Facts first, then we have faith, then we have feeling and fellowship. That's the order. I understand that. But as believers and as Bible believers, we need to give an emphasis to this because, especially right now, what's the most important thing? What are you fighting? I'll tell you what you're fighting if you're a saved child of God. You are fighting the same thing you always fight, and that is the pressure from this flesh, from the world, and from the devil to get away from Jesus Christ, to push Jesus further back and get closer to the world, to push Jesus further back and get closer to yourself, to sin, or to the devil. The same thing we always fight, we're fighting now. And so I want to preach to you just a little bit about this thing of fellowship and about walking with God. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God, Genesis chapter 5. The Bible tells us in Genesis 6, Noah walked with God. You'll notice that phrase, walked with God. It didn't say God walked with Enoch or God walked with Noah. What does that mean? That means we walk with God, we fellowship with God on God's terms. Amos 3, verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Are you agreeing with God? Then you can fellowship. If you're not agreeing with God concerning things in your own personal life, 
you are not fellowshipping with God. The word commune is used often in the Bible to refer to communing together. We use the word communion regarding the time when we take the Lord's Supper. We commune as the body of Christ, as the body of believers together. That word is oftentimes used. And here in 1 John chapter 1, this will be our text, the word fellowship <clears throat> is used. 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. First thing I'd like to say about this most important thing right now in your life is regarding finding fellowship, finding the fellowship of God. You can't find, find fellowship with God without two things. And the first one should be obvious, and that is salvation. If you're watching this or listening to this and you're not saved, you cannot fellowship with God. The Bible says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're not saved, you are not in the Spirit. In other words, God is a Spirit, John 4, 24. And you can't fellowship with a spiritual being if you're just in the flesh of your own self and your own sins. You have to be a son of God. You have to have sonship before you can have fellowship. And so if you want to seek God's fellowship, number one, you've got to be saved. You have to have salvation. John chapter number 1, the Bible says, He came unto His own, Jesus Christ, came unto His own, and His own received Him not. What did they do? They crucified Him. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You become a child of God by salvation. So if you want a fellowship with God, first and foremost, you have to get on His terms. It's kind of like Noah when he built the ark. If you wanted to be saved, you had to get on God's terms and get on the ark. Of course, the people didn't want to listen to Noah. He preached for 120 years. The Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness. They had to agree to God's terms, God's judgment. And if you're not willing to agree with God's judgment and God's estimation about yourself, namely that you are a sinner and you are headed to hell in your sinful condition, and then the good news that Christ died for your sins, He was buried, He rose again from the dead, and He will save you if you'll believe on Him. Romans chapter number 10, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You can become a child of God today, real simply, by turning to Jesus Christ for salvation. If you want to seek a relationship with Christ, you have to stand at the altar. It's kind of like a couple. When they become a married couple, they make a decision to receive each other at a point in time. When has that happened in your life? You say, well, I've just always been a Christian. No, that's not how the Bible presents salvation. You're not just born into the faith. You say, well, I was born into the church. I was raised in church. We're not talking about being in church. We're talking about being in Christ. We're not talking about having fellowship with people in religion. We're talking about having fellowship with God in a relationship. It must start with salvation. If you're in 1 John, let's flip over to chapter number 5. Look in 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 9. 1 John 5, 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. 
He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Do you know you're saved? I know I'm saved. I have the witness of God in myself. I know I'm saved not just because I feel it, and I do feel it. And by the way, it has to be an experience. It has to be experiential with you. You have to meet the Savior. This thing has to do with faith. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. It's not whether or not your mom or dad believes on Christ or your aunt or your uncle or some friend that you have. You have to have faith. Do you have the witness of God in your heart? Do you know that you know that you know that you've passed from death unto life because you're saved, because you know Christ? Look at the next thing. He mentions the record that God gave. This is the record, verse 11. Here it is right here. It's recorded in the Bible. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Look in verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Two things. I've got the witness in my heart, and I've got my wit the witness right here in this word. I have the record. You say, I want, to, I want to have a relationship with God. I want to commune with God. I want to fellowship with God. You have to be saved. You have to experience salvation. Now, the second thing I want to say about finding fellowship relates to Christians, believers, okay? You can be saved but not be in fellowship. You can be a son of God but be on bad terms with your heavenly father. Just because you're on bad terms with your heavenly father doesn't mean you're out of the family. You can be having a bad relationship with your, your uh, paternal, uh, your, your, your uh, actual lineage, your relationship in, in physical life. You can have a bad relationship with your mom or your dad, but that doesn't change your DNA. Or if you've been adopted into the family, that doesn't change the fact that you're adopted into that family. And so as a Christian, as a believer, you can be out of fellowship. Don't confuse sonship with fellowship. Some people think just because they're saved, they're in fellowship with God, and they're allowing all kind of sin in their life, and they're going right on their merry way, but deep down they realize somehow their prayers seem to be bouncing off the ceiling. Somehow the Bible doesn't seem to come alive. Somehow they don't seem to have the motivation to sing the old songs of Zion anymore and listen to the old time preaching and attend church and tell people about Jesus. There's something not right. I'll tell you what's not right. You're not in fellowship. How do you have fellowship? Number one, there has to be salvation. Number two, there has to be separation. Social distancing. Praise the Lord. People are finally getting it. You need to stay away from some stuff. Because if you touch some stuff, you're going to get a virus. 2 Corinthians, he talks about, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. There's your COVID-19 verse right there. Watch what you touch. Wear a mask, put on some gloves, stay away from things. David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Separation. This deals with your spiritual life. This deals with a spiritual walk. Here in 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 7, he says, If we walk in the light, it's a spiritual walk in spiritual ways, and it produces a spiritual work. You say, Preacher, I want to have a closer walk with God. You have to be willing to separate yourself because if you're walking with God, that means he's the leader and you're the follower. And as he walks, you have to get up close to him. And in doing so, you're naturally going to pull away from other things. You have to understand walking with God means not walking with other things certain individuals. Walking with God means not walking with certain things. Preacher, I want a fellowship with God. To find that fellowship, there must be separation. And that produces a spiritual work, a work of faith. Now, how do we follow through in our fellowship? Some of you, you're obviously fellowshipping with God. You're trying to. You fall down, you skin your knees, you get back up, and you begin to follow again, and you begin to walk again, and you know the Lord's out there, and you're playing catch-up. Have you ever tried to play catch-up? 
And you run and run, and you start giving out of breath, and you bend over, and you catch your breath, and you run again. You're trying to play catch up because you fall and you get down. Well, praise the Lord, at least you're getting back up. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm glad you're trying to play catch up. And look, we can never repay him for all he's done for us, and we can never get to that perfect place that we think we're going to get. Paul said, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to attain. He said, I'm trying to apprehend that for which I'm apprehended of. He was always chasing after, always following after the Lord, and that's how it's supposed to be. And thank God you're trying to play catch up. Thank God you're trying to follow after him. But how do we follow through with our fellowship? Well, I believe we have to realize that fellowship is dependent on faith and not works. Faith and not works. Colossians chapter 2 verse number 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. When you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you trusted Christ by faith, not by works. So he says, as you've received Christ, walk in him. Walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And when you follow through in fellowship, this produces the fruit of the Spirit. Now here's a good indication, Galatians chapter 5, a good indication that you might be out of fellowship with God. Now here's where people get messed up in their doctrine because they become fruit inspectors and they have to inspect everybody to see if they're producing what they consider to be fruit in their own lives and then they begin to judge whether or not you're saved. Well, if what you have won't bring you back to church on Sunday night, what makes you think it's going to get you to heaven? Well, that ain't going to get you to heaven in, to begin with. Jesus Christ and Him dying for your sins and you believing in His atonement is going to get you to heaven. And so this idea of looking and people and judging them by things in your life. Maybe you haven't said a curse word since you've been saved, but boy, you sure have been thinking bad about people. You sure have been coveting that new dress or that new car or that new whatever. You see, we don't think along those lines. But let's play the devil's advocate. The Bible does lay down some parameters and does help us to see some things so we can find out whether or not we are following through in our walk with God. Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Notice in Galatians chapter number 5, come down to verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Wow, what a list. Nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Nine is the number of fruitfulness in the Bible. Galatians is the ninth book in the New Testament. And so we here have the fruit of the Spirit. A work is something you do. A fruit is something that is produced. A work is like a machine that works in a factory. An apple grows on a tree. A work can be dead. A fruit is alive. And so you want to understand that the fruit of the Spirit comes from an outside source. It comes from the Spirit, not from the flesh. This is the seed of the Word of God, and that seed goes down into the soil. Some of you are planting gardens, and maybe you go and you're able to buy the plants, and that's the easy way to do it, and they're already kind of big. Um, you, but some of you, you start off small, and maybe you have a, a little greenhouse, or you have some small uh, styrofoam cups, and you, you just fill it with about that much dirt. You put your seed in there, not very deep, and you want it to be moist, and you want it to have some heat, so it begins to germinate. And that seed goes down into the soil that's soft, that's watered, and it grows and it germinates and it sprouts. And so the seed comes from an outside source. So you look in your own life and say, do I have fellowship with God? Well, do you have any of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. People say, well, I have the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are not the fruit of the Spirit. Gifts are given, fruit is grown. Gifts come by discovery. Fruit comes by pruning. Gifts are not in stages. Samson had that mighty power from God. It wasn't some little stage, you know, when he was, when he was 10, you know, he could whip a cat, a uh, little cat. And then when he was 12, you know, he could whip a dog. And, and then when he finally became a man, he could rend a lion. That's not how it was. He had that gift all along. The fruit of the Spirit does come in stages. 
Now there's a division with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and peace, that's inward fruit dealing with self. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, that's outward fruit dealing with others. And I had to say that, didn't I? We're going to see that in 1 John. If you're not walking right with other people, you're not going to walk right with God. If you're not walking right with God, you're not going to walk right with other people. That thing's a triangle. The fruit of the Spirit's the same way. There's inward, there's outward, and then there's upward fruit, faith, meekness, and temperance. You can't have faith without love. You can't have gentleness without long suffering. And joy is a lot of fun, but it doesn't last unless you have peace. All of these tie in together. You say, preacher, I've got it down. I've got faith. I can move all mountains. Well, I don't believe that. Anyway, I've got faith. Okay, what about your gentleness? What about your patience? I've got joy. What kind of joy? Joy that you uh, get to stay at home and work from home. What kind of joy do you have? Now, we don't need to concentrate so much on individual fruit as the heart soil. Like I said, the seed comes from the outside source. The Bible says in Matthew 13, the seed is the Word of God. That goes into the soil. So is your heart conducive and is your heart the type of soil that is soft enough and can hold the nutrients without the weeds that the Seed so can germinate and grow. And so when we try to follow through with our fellowship, the Lord has given us some things in our life to be introspective with, and we can back up and say, okay, are these things evident in my life? When other people see me and think of me, do they think of some of these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit? There are some people I know, and I think, you know, that's a patient person. Or I think of somebody, and I say, you know, they, they, are, they love people. They have the, the fruit of the Spirit love. Or that person there, they are uh, they're temperate. Do you have the fruit of the Spirit? Now, I'll give you some things regarding fellowship here that ties into following through. Should be easy to remember. Number one, you need a fellowship with the Savior. That's evident. It mentions it over in 1 John chapter number 1, fellowship with God, the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 9, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'll get into this in just a minute when we talk about suffering. But you're called unto the fellowship of Jesus Christ, not just with Jesus Christ, but His fellowship. It's like you're in a, in a group. They talk about the fellows. You have a fellowship dealing with some of the uh, academics and some of the people. They have a fellowship. They have a group. You could say constituents, you could say colleagues, you could say a church body. You have a fellowship of people. You're called unto the fellowship. You are called to be a Christian. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You have a holy calling on you. God has put his hand on you as a believer. And he says, hey, come out from among them and be separate and, and come with me. Follow with me. Fellowship with me. We're called to fellowship with Jesus Christ. The very idea of some of these preachers not praying in the name of Jesus Christ, that's repugnant. That's repulsive. You're called into fellowship with the Savior. Number two, you're called into fellowship with the Spirit. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. Fellowship of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, he says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So when you were saved, the Bible says you had an operation that took place on the inside where your flesh was separated from your soul and spirit. That had to take place or the sins of the flesh would affect your spiritual life. Your spirit is born again when you're saved. John chapter number 3. You have to understand that. The spirit is regenerated. It's given life. Your spirit is born again and is joined to his spirit. But if you still commit the sins of the flesh, which we all do as Christians, if there's not a division that takes place, and here's the references. You can look them up when you get home. Well, you're already home. <laughs> you can look them up, you know, when you put your Doritos down. Hebrews chapter number 4 and Colossians chapter number 2. Hebrews 4, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Colossians chapter number 2, you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting off the body by the circumcision of Christ. And so there's a circumcision that cuts away this soul 
and the Spirit from the flesh. So when you commit a sin as a Christian, it doesn't damn your soul to hell. Your soul has been saved. Your spirit has been born again. You've been washed in the blood. And now there's a division that's made. Now, on practical grounds, obviously our, our, um, our standing is in Christ. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. So positionally, you're in Christ. But practically, you're living down here in this insanity. You're living down here in this world. And you have to learn to fellowship with the Spirit instead of the flesh. That means you need to talk to God who is a spirit. That means you not only are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, but God is a spirit and the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says he sealed us with his Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 13, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And so the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. So the Holy Spirit's inside. You need to fellowship with Him. Talk to Him. Commune with Him. We're called to fellowship with the Son, with the Savior, Jesus Christ. We're called to fellowship with the Spirit. And we're called to fellowship with the saints of God. 1 John 1, verse number 3, our text, our fellowship with us, he says. Ephesians 3, verse number 9, Paul mentions this. He says, To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. What's he talking about? The mystery. He's talking about the mystery of the body of Christ. What is that mystery? That Jew and Gentile alike are composed of one body, which is a spiritual body with a spiritual head, which is Jesus Christ. And that's what takes place in this church age. When someone believes on Christ, they are placed into that body of believers. It's called the fellowship of the mystery. You are called to fellowship with saints. Look, I know we're having to do all this remotely right now. We can't shake hands. We can't wave at each other across the pew. We can't laugh when somebody gets up and they sing and then they have to stop and start over or they mess up and they say something funny. We can't share in that. We can't laugh at the preacher when he says these funny, hilarious jokes that he comes up with. Har, har. Um, but we fellowship remotely, obviously. Some people as Christians, they think absence does make the heart grow fonder for some reason. And it doesn't. And they stay out of fellowship with other believers. You need a Christian friend to fellowship with. And God's given us a great church family. Some of you, you could probably have some of your best friends in the world if you would just show yourself friendly. He that hath friends must show himself friendly, the Bible says. Why don't you introduce yourself to someone? Why don't you say, hey, let me take you out to lunch. God forbid you got to buy somebody's lunch. Cheapskate. Why don't you befriend somebody? The fellowship of the mystery is more than just staying at home and studying about the mystery of the body of Christ. It's talking about practically you're having fellowship with the people that are in this body. Not just because you're watching YouTube videos and you've learned how to rightly divide the word of truth. And by the way, those of you that that's what you are, you're just internet Christians, I just want to, I want to just kind of give something out here. Maybe you might think about it in your mind. Maybe I should just quit my job or get a transfer or find a place to move where I can fellowship with other Christians. That would be a novel idea. Well, I just can't make that sacrifice. Okay. And this brings me to my next point. And I'll give you these. I don't have time to give you these other verses on fellowshipping with the saints. But in Acts chapter 2, they fellowship steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the Bible says. But I'll move on to this one since I mentioned sacrifice. We're called to fellowship with Christ's sufferings. And the suffering that you're going through in life, sometimes we think it's more than we can bear. Then when you think of that, you need to consider Christ. Consider Christ. Paul said in Philippians 3.10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Romans chapter number 8, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Philippians 1.29, for it is given unto you in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake. Now let me say this, there are two things with suffering. The first thing has to do with, I believe, the context of those verses. 
And in 1 Peter chapter number 4, when he mentions the fiery trial, which is to try you. Two aspects of a fiery trial. Practically and first and foremost, I believe, doctrinally, it refers to Christians that suffer for the name of Christ, which we as believers haven't had to experience. Maybe you've experienced it on a low-key level. Maybe you've been made fun of at work. Maybe you've been denied promotions at work. Maybe you had a situation where your spouse left you because you were trying to follow God and they didn't follow God. You took it for Christ. Maybe you had somebody that you were close to that they distanced themselves from you because you got closer to God. And you did suffer something in a relationship because you put Jesus Christ first. That has to do with the fellowship of his sufferings. In New Testament times and even in times across our country or across our world, I should say, there are Christians that are being persecuted physically, that are being locked up, that are being put in prison, that are being killed for naming the name of Christ as Christians. We should pray for those martyrs. It may come down to where that happens to us one day. But there's another aspect of trial and suffering, and that has to do with the sufferings of life. The thorns that we have in our flesh, like Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians 11. He besought the Lord thrice that he might depart from him, and God said, My grace is sufficient for thee. Paul later on said, I will gladly glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Your suffering is not in vain. So how do you know? Read the oldest book in the Bible. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible and it deals with the oldest problem, the problem of suffering. God is looking at you to see how you will respond to suffering. The devil's looking as well. He's peering over and he's peeking down in to see if you're going to deny Christ, if you're going to get bitter, if you're going to blame God, if you're going to get upset and mad with God, if you're going to quit in your Christian race. And the Lord's looking to see if you're going to glorify Him and be thankful in all things. Fellowship with the Savior sometimes involves suffering. And if you allow that suffering to twist you in the wrong direction, it will break your fellowship with Christ. So we need to follow through with our fellowship. Now finally, I'd like to, well, I've got a couple things. These next two really fall together. Faking fellowship. Some people fake fellowship. In other words, they, it's kind of like the fruit of the Spirit can be Imitated, if you've ever been to someone's house and they have a bowl sitting on the table or on the coffee table and it has all these, this fruit in it, you think it's real at first, but then you realize it's this plastic fruit. It's not real. It's kind of like you go to a wedding or something and you see all these flowers, then you realize, oh, these, that there's no aroma, there's no smell. These are not real flowers. They're fake. And oftentimes Christians fake their fellowship. I mentioned this previously. They confuse sonship with fellowship, so they think everything's fine. Or they fake fellowship by fellowshipping with sinners. This is the law of substitution. You can't go through life without fulfilling certain needs as a creature. We have social needs. We have needs as an individual human that God has made us. And you are going to fill those needs either with God or with the devil, either with God's people or with the devil's people. You can fellowship with sin and with sinners. I gave you the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. What communion hath light with darkness? What fellowship, he says, hath righteousness with unrighteousness. Some of you have no business hanging around some of the friends that you have. I know some people have to work with some of these folks and you have to deal with some of these sinners, but you don't have to sit down at the table and fellowship with them. Some of you are being corrupted and being polluted by the sinners that you are fellowshipping with. Ephesians 5 verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Proverbs 1 verse 10, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Just say, no, thank you. Nope, can't do that. I can't sit out here after work on the tailgate and pop tops with you because, you know, I'm just not going to do it. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. Or you can just say, no, thank you. I'm going home. No, thank you. I'm going home to spend time with my wife and my kids. 
Proverbs 23, 17, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Some of you have the wrong idea of what success is. You think success has to do with making more and more money and to do with power, putting yourself in some type of political position or putting yourself in some type of business position or within your own company trying to run over the guy in front of you so you can be the manager, you can be the boss. Whatever it is, you have these ideas and therefore you have to rub shoulders with people you have no business being around. Or you have this idea that these people that are doing certain things that you know you shouldn't do are actually having fun. And you're envying sinners. Young people oftentimes idolize. That's why they have that, that popular reality show, American Idol, where these people get up and they idolize people that have God-given talents. God gave them that talent not to abuse it, but to use it for His glory. And shame on them that they're not using those talents and those glories for God. God's given you a smart brain and you're able to use it. You should use it for God. God's given you the ability to sing. You should sing in church. You should be a blessing to the congregation. You should encourage people in song. Not sing about, you know, some uh, tear in your beer or, or whatever the godless stuff they're singing about today. Or even if it's some emotional song singing about people. All this stuff now, even in Christian music, is all turned about the people. We have a mouth so we can glorify Jesus Christ. And we should sing to glorify Him. But people have their envy towards sinners and they fall. You don't need to fellowship with sin. You don't need to fellowship with sinners. And you don't need to fellowship with spirits. Say, preacher, I'm saved. I, I have the Holy Spirit. I can't be possessed by a devil. Well, if you'll give me a chapter and verse, I'll give you two that shows the opposite. The Bible says Peter was preaching there in Acts chapter number 5 when Ananias and Sapphira came in. And he had already uh, told, he already told uh, Ananias about what he had done was wrong when he said he sold the land for this much. And then he lied. And he dropped down dead when Sapphira came in. He says, why is Satan filled by the heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? The Bible speaks about the last days, doctrines of devils. Many shall fall away from the faith, departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Timothy 3 or 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You have no business having fellowship with Satan or fellowship with ungodly things. And a lot of Christians, they've just embraced all of this stuff, all of this mysticism, all of this witchcraft, all of this uh, science fiction type of stuff. You have to be real careful. That stuff will seduce you. You have no business having fellowship with it. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me read this to you. Some of you still aren't convinced. I can feel it. I can't see your faces, but... You stopped eating your chips, and I can tell it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look down in verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, back up to verse 1, look at this. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, verse number 3, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. First, he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which you have not received, you might well bear with him. He says, you dumb Corinthians, you are so have such a propensity toward bad things. Somebody comes preaching the false spirit, you would receive that spirit and you would listen to him and, and put up with him. Some of you Christians are so out of fellowship with God, you're now in fellowship with spirits. That same channel, that same place that you allow the Holy Spirit to come in, you allow the unclean spirits to come into your life. Dangerous thing. You know, King Saul, he had the Spirit of God at one point, but later on the Bible tells us about King Saul, how that he went and he sought counsel from a witch. 
Samson, he got so confused and turned around, he began not just to fellowship with sinners, he began to fellowship with himself. He began to lie to himself. Our text in 1 John chapter 1 talks about deceiving ourselves, and you can deceive yourself because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, and Samson thought he had it. I got this. You ever hear people say that? They're so full of pride, you try to help them. You know, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. Hey, let me, let me get you. I got this. I got this. I got this. Samson went out and shook himself. He told her, you know, just tie my, tie my hair together, you know, just weave it together. He went out and shook himself. He told her all these things, and the fourth time he goes out, she had cut his hair because he revealed the secret of his power was a relationship with God as a Nazarite. It was no power in the actual long strands of hair. The power had to do with his surrender to God's vow. And he went out, and he said, I got this. He deceived himself. He was fellowshipping not with the Spirit of God. He was fellowshipping with his own spirit. I got this. And he couldn't break loose. Mary and Joseph, they thought they had it all together. They were familiar with Christ. Familiarity is not fellowship. That's why you can have your head full of knowledge. You can have all kind of biblical facts. You can go through the Bible 150 times and be out of fellowship with God. Mary and Joseph and the whole family there, they were at Jerusalem. They left, and for two days... They were just so used to Jesus being around. They were just so used to hearing his voice back with the company, and he, they just assumed that he was there. Two days go by. They don't even realize he's not with everybody. How many days have gone by since you realized you weren't in fellowship with him? You were just in fellowship with the familiarity of being in fellowship with him. Now, I'm going to give you these steps of Falling from fellowship, and then we'll be done. Falling from fellowship, how does it happen? Well, if we go back to the Garden of Eden in our mind's eye, we can see Eve over near to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she had to look at it, obviously, before she even got over there close. For some reason, she's over there right next to it. That's a bad sign. Lord tells you not to eat of a certain tree. What are you doing over there standing there by it? If there's something in your life that tempts you, you need to stay away from it. Well, I got the power, I got the power, I can be around it. No, you don't need to be around it. Some of you have had alcohol problems in the past, so when you buy bottled water, you don't need to go to the grocery store to get it because you go down the aisle. A lot of times they'll have the alcohol on one side and the water on the other side. What a stupid thing. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And so Eve, she got over there, she's standing over there next to the thing. That's the first problem. But she began listening. And these are the steps I'll give you. She began listening to the wrong voice. Just a little bit. But she started listening to the serpent's voice. You say, well, I'm, I'm not listening to nobody. Well, you ain't been to preaching in I don't know how long. Well, I'm not listening to nobody. Well, you hadn't heard the Bible and been listening to the Bible or reading the Bible or listening to any preaching. You're listening to somebody. Whose voice have you been listening to? Your own voice? Are you now a God? But the steps move from there. She began listening, then she began learning. Because in that passage, the Bible says that when Satan tempted her, he says, For God doth know that in the day thereof you, your, you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The temptation was for her to step up, to educate herself, to learn more than she currently knew. The quest for knowledge can be satanic. Now, the quest for right kind of knowledge, as you read about in the book of Proverbs, is good. But the quest for the knowledge of good and evil is very dangerous. She began to learn. You need to be concerned with learning what God wants you to learn instead of learning what the world wants you to learn. The Bible says, be simple concerning that which is evil. 
To be simple-minded is to be just kind of dumb. The Bible says the simple pass on and are punished. In other words, they don't have, you know, sense to, they're driving down the road and it says bridges out and they never learn how to read, so they ride right through and go off on the bridge. And so the idea is that a simpleton or a simple-minded person, they just don't think, they don't learn, they just want to stay in their own ignorance, they won't sit down because it makes their head hurt to figure out how to get the algorithm and all that kind of stuff, so they just don't want to do it. It's laziness, it's being a simpleton. But, Paul said, be simple concerning that which is evil. You don't need to go down into the sewer. But what happens is you begin listening to the wrong voice and then you begin learning the wrong things. Some of you are impressed with the people sometimes on Jeopardy that can answer them questions. Boom, boom, boom. And sometimes it is very impressive with the mind that God's given some people. It's pretty amazing some people how they have almost instant recollection of a recollection of certain thoughts and uh, dates and figures and facts. That's pretty amazing. But a lot of times on that show Jeopardy, you're thinking, who cares about these things? And if you did, a lot of the stuff is stuff that Christians shouldn't even know about anyway. What was the top ten hit on the charts in pop music in 1985? Who gives a flip? Some of you Christians need to learn how to not give a flip. Amen. There's a learning. You begin to fall from fellowship when you listen to the wrong voices. You begin to learn the wrong things. And then that leads to a leaning. I'll give you two examples, Rehoboam and Joash. In 1 Kings chapter number 12, Rehoboam takes over after Solomon. And at first he says, I need to figure out how to rule and reign over this great people. So he gets the old men together and says, what do you all think I should do? The old men say, look, if you're going to rule over these people, they need to know that you are a servant of the people. You need to treat them in such and such a manner. He says, okay. And then he gets the young guys together. He says, what do y'all think I should do? They say, look, if you want to rule over these people, you need to rule with a rod of iron. You need to whip them. You need to beat them. You need to let them know who's boss. He forsook the counsel of the old man with the counsel of the young man. He leaned on the wrong advice. The foundation and the background of the decisions you're making come from leaning on some source. What is that source? Is it the knowledge of God from the Bible, from the Word of God? It depends on who you've been fellowshipping with. There have been certain issues I've read and studied on, and I can read a certain thing, and, and I'm telling you, and probably because it's my, uh, my skeptical nature. I can read a certain thing and they have all these facts, supposed facts, they have their arguments, they set their case, and I'm like, man, I, that's a good case, I think I might agree with that. Then I go and I read the other story. It's, it's kind of like you have the two, two attorneys giving their, their spiels. And I read the other story and go through the whole thing, man, I, that's pretty convincing too. I, when I'm reading this side, I agree with that. When I'm reading this side, I agree with that. That's a dangerous place to be in. Kind of like a chameleon. Just kind of whoever you're fellowshipping with at the moment, that's what you become. You've got to be real careful with that. And that's what happened to Rehoboam. And Joash did the same thing. He followed Jehoiada, the high priest. Joash is a little king at seven years' age. He's made king. And Jehoiada instructed him in the ways of the Lord. And he did great as long as Jehoiada was alive. But as soon as Jehoiada, the high priest, died, the princes came around. And then they bowed down to the prince. And they began to talk to the prince. And he gave heed to them. And he forsook God. Because he began to lean on the wrong understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Fellowship with him. And then the last one, not just listening, learning, leaning, but loving. In 1 Kings chapter number 13, the Bible tells us about Solomon. The Bible tells us here in 1 Kings chapter number 13, there came... Not 1 Kings 13, 1 Kings 11. Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning the which the Lord said to the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. In verse number 4, it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. This idea that you just fall into love, you don't make a choice, is a bunch of hogwash. You choose to love. 
And if you begin to fellowship with someone long enough, you will love that person in some respect. And so the idea of loving is the last one. In Proverbs 23, verse 26, he says, My son, give me thine heart. You need to love God with all of your heart. The most important thing right now is for you to love God with all your heart. I hope your doctrine's right. I hope your opinions are right. I hope your convictions are right. But most importantly, I hope your fellowship with Jesus Christ is right. We can grow in stages as we mature and as we fellowship. But as we do that, we have to be willing to yield to the Spirit so the Spirit can produce the fruit in our life. There was a man, he lived next door to a, another farm. There was farmers out, and he was out walking his property close to the man's uh, barns and corral and everything, and he saw these two oxen in there just having it out, just going at, at each other. And he called his neighbor over there, and he went over there and said, Hey, man, what in the world's going on? Why are you letting your oxen do like this? You know, I mean, why don't you get in there and straighten them out or whatever? And the guy said, Look, I've got to do this because if I don't, if I don't let them get in there and fight it out now, then they are going to get tied in to that yoke, and they're going to be pulling in opposite directions. they got to fight it out now so they can find out who's the boss so the one can follow the other. And when you think about your Christian life, you need to come to terms with the fact that Jesus Christ is to be leading and we are to be walking with Him, following with Him, fellowshipping with Him. The most important thing in life, I know with all the stuff going on, you've got to keep up to date. I get all that. Be careful to keep your fellowship with Christ as the most important thing in your life. Father, thank you for the text. Thank you for these examples we have. God, I pray that you might convict us about this. Help us to take inventory, to examine our lives in view of the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, to realize we need to, to till the ground. We need to make the ground soft and ready for the seed. And Lord, we know you can do things in our life if we'll separate and we'll give attention to our walk with you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking us back whenever we come back to fellowship and when we play catch up and we get back. Lord, thank you for not condemning us, but for loving us. God, I pray that you might help us now and encourage us to keep the main thing, the main thing, even when it's so tempting to be so focused on all these other things in our life, especially at this time. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our church family. We pray a special blessing on each and every member. Pray, God, that you might keep them safe. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen.